Hey everybody, welcome back to another Nature's Always Right video. Today, we're gonna be gardening with my parents. Here's my mom. Good morning. You might remember her from my most popular video, actually. I wouldn't have it without her. So um, today we're in the garden and we're gonna be prepping and setting up our beds for winter. We'll be planting some direct seeds, we'll be pulling out crops, showing you some really great no-till ways to run your raised garden beds. Um, for maximum soil health and nutrient retention in your beds. I'll show you what we're gonna be adding into the beds to refresh them. Maybe I'll throw in a couple other things that we're working on today on the homestead, but today's gonna to be a more in-depth gardening video. Okay, mom, so we're clearing these beds out and what are you working on here? Well, what I'm doing is uh, chopping up all the mallow that's basically done and going to uh, chop it off all the way down to the roots and at that point I'm just going to leave the roots in the ground mm -hmm. to decompose just getting rid of the top layer and that's going to go to the chickens. Yep so we got food for the animals, food for the soil by leaving those roots underneath that high carbon content of the roots they're just going to get devoured by those microbes. We're going to leave all this decomposed corn husks that was here so it's just more great plant material to decompose. Okay, so you can see what my mom did here, clipped it down just above the soil level. That's fine because we're gonna bring in another couple inches of compost and bury that. Um, so now my dad and I, we're gonna go fill up compost. My mom's gonna get these beds ready for us and then we'll come back and prep all these beds with different amendments, um, microbial inoculants that I've made and give you some more details on how to refresh these beds. Just get them set up for winter for some greens and then you know, once the big frost comes, they'll go dormant for winter. So what I've been doing here with all the basil that is basically on its last few days um, is I am going through and I don't want to waste. So I pick up a uh, stem that has enough good leaves for me for uh, basil pesto or something that I can use right away in the next day or two. And then I'm just clipping them, putting them in here. I take off the uh, flowers at the top just to make it cleaner when I bring it into the house. Um, you know, I've got fewer seeds flying everywhere and fewer tasks to do in order to harvest the leaves. So that's what I'm doing. The huge pile is just basically anything that's really not usable or too much trouble. But these are looking really good still. So I want to get those off the plant um, and into the house pretty quickly into a cool environment. And we're going to make some pesto later. We sure are. So then guys, we had a few plants left over that survived the summer. The chard made it in these beds. So my mom just took off the dead, really bad leaves um, so that the plant can focus its energy on growing new leaves. Um, back here, we had some totsoy, a couple beets still going. So left those and then we'll just be planting seeds around it. Okay, so with those beds cleared, now all we have to do is put some more compost on top just to refresh it, add in some more nutrients, more biology. And then after that, our beds will be ready to plant either with direct seeds or transplants. As far as the compost that we're adding and how much should I add, we're gonna do about three wheelbarrows to these beds. This is the first time that we've added more soil after starting these beds. And if you remember, and you can watch the video to see how that we made these, at the bottom there's wood chips and wood branches. So those have settled, the soil has settled. So that's why we're adding a bit more. I think after this, going into next spring, I probably only add one, maybe two at all from here on out because the beds are gonna be so fertile. Um, because of the no-till and the nutrient program that we have everything on, the biology is going to take care of everything that the plants need. So I hope that gives you a few tips on how much compost should you add to your beds. So no, the woods are not burning down. We're just doing a couple brush pile fires. These were um, leftover brush piles from last year clearing out different trees and things. So we're just finishing up getting this cleaner um, because over here we want to plant uh, a couple more garden beds and we wanna put a greenhouse back into this corner. Um, it's gonna be a great location for protection and then it's gonna get great sun exposure all year round. So now that our beds are prepped, we're gonna add our amendments and then a final layer of my super compost that I've made that's from rabbit manure, hay, and then a bunch of other natural farming inputs that I've made. So we've got liquid and dry amendments here. You can run your garden on just really good compost. You don't need any of this to run a successful garden. What these do though, is give your plants everything that they need, including biology, plant hormones, stimulants, all these sorts of things um, are in both of these buckets. So we'll start with the dry. So what I have in here 
I have azomite, which is minerals, sea salt, which is minerals, kelp meal, which is also more minerals. Minerals feed soil biology, and of course the plants as well. Uh, so it's feeding the whole circle of life in your beds. When we have all of our vitamins and minerals and probiotics, we are extremely healthy. I haven't been sick in many, many years. Um, so the same goes for any immune system on the planet. Um, if you hear that the body or the plant's body has everything that it needs, it will be able to mount a defense using its own natural immune system. And then I've got a couple inoculants in here. I have Bokashi grain, you guys know I'm all about Bokashi composting. This can also be added into your soil. Now this compost that I'm using has been very wet for a long time because of rains and you know the tarp came off. So that soil is a little bit anaerobic and these Bokashi grains are facultative anaerobes which means they can switch back and forth between a low oxygen or no oxygen environment and a high oxygen environment. This soil is going to be low oxygen but we want more in there. So these guys are going to help um, to basically kind of eat up those uh, and deal with those anaerobic microbes if there is anything bad to knock it out. This Bokashi is from um, SD Microbes, uh, a friend and company that I've been working with since the beginning and they make all of this from organic brewer's grain. They inoculate it with um, multiple inoculants and minerals. So if you want 10% off of any of the SD Microbes products, you can use my code nature77 and that will get you 10% off. I'll put a link down in the description. I've also got their BioVast compost in here, which is a fungal dominated compost. So that's just adding in more biology, pushing your soil a bit more fungal since most of our soils are going to be bacterial dominant, but getting more of those fungal connections increases the network communication between the plants, the microbes and everything going on. So for my wet amendments, this has a lot of Korean natural farming stuff into, in it, which I'm not going to go into depth into, but there's calcium, calcium phosphate, fish amino acid, which is going to give a huge nitrogen boost. That's also a fungal food that's made by SD microbes that you can get. That's a great thing to spray on young plants that are in their vegetative growth stage. I skipped the IMO2 because I'm going to make an IMO3, which is the more advanced uh, diverse microbial grow out. Um, so we'll be adding that as a dry amendment um, when, once I create that. I also have oriental herbal nutrient and humic acid in here. Humic acid is a great thing to add to any, any tea, aerated tea. It's a massively good fungal food. And I think that's it. So we're going to add five gallons of water to this put it in a waterer and lightly water onto these uh, four beds. So here's the order of, of how we're gonna do everything. Amendments, super compost, plant the seeds, water in with these um, inoculants here, and then do a final watering. Now we're about to get rain in a couple days here, so I will probably just do a light watering, just make sure the seeds are gonna have enough moisture for the next couple days probably have to come out tomorrow again to make sure that they're moist and then we're gonna get rain and then that will infiltrate everything so always remember check your weather um, when you're planting your garden um, so you can have a plan of what you're gonna do there may you may get rain the next day so you don't want to super soak your beds you don't want soil to stay super wet for a long time always want to think about how um, is rain and microbes feeding the soil so microbes are constantly breaking things down making it available to plant roots um, so a lot, of, a lot of that is on the surface too, right? So when the rain comes, it waters and those things infiltrate into the ground for the roots to go get them. So we're, we're mimicking nature in that way by setting up these soil layers like that. So here's the coverage amount that we did for the dry amendments. A very light amount because this is all powerful stuff. One thing I did forget to tell you, this is calcium uh, in the form of uh, coral. So we were just about to plant, but unfortunately my parents have to go. So I'm gonna have to plant all by myself. But Aww. thank you so much for all the help and we did a lot of good work. So excited to send you home with some veggies. And uh, all right, love you. Love you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> it's been fun. Okay guys, all the beds are prepped and ready for seeds. So now what time of year is it? Um, we are at the end of September, but I want you to pretend like it's really more like the beginning of August, because that's when um, I should have planted direct seeds for my fall crops. Now I'm in zone 7A, so if you're more northern, 
and you have colder temps sooner, you would push back that date, planting date even further. It's very easy to just search your hardiness zone and the recommendations of planting times online. For my seeds, this is an awesome way to organize seeds. If you are a home gardener, you just have small packets of seeds. These are photo organizers. You can get them on Amazon or wherever. Um, highly recommend organizing them like this. If um, you know, you're a farmer or you have a lot more seeds, um, these won't fit in there obviously. But I love this organization method uh, for smaller amounts of seeds. I get all my seeds from True Leaf Market unless they're specialty. Um, I have a link in the description uh, for all the seeds. Um, and all the different things that I'm using in this video to help you guys find them, to see if it's something that interests you or you would, might want, or you could make on your own even uh, for some of these things. And if you buy from any of those links in the description, it's just a way that you can support the channel at no cost to yourself. And I always put the links, I'm trying to help you guys um, make it, your life easier. Okay, so what are we gonna plant then? So because we are into September, we're gonna start getting colder temps by November, and here in Tennessee, we'll be in the 40s at night. Okay, so in November, you can get a frost. So all summer stuff's done. We're just gonna be doing greens, so kale, chard, lettuce, herbs, cilantro, parsley. We'll do green onions, root veg like radish, beets, turnips, um, a couple Korean radishes, some Korean greens, arugula, uh, things like that. I am going to plant a couple brassicas like broccoli and cabbage just to see what happens, but I don't, there's not going to be enough sun energy at this point in the season for it to develop a head, but just to see what will happen, we'll do that. I could always eat the leaves, right? Um, and this is just part of growing in a new climate, trying to figure all that out. And you know, I'm just like you guys, I get busy and I didn't plant the fall garden, did I? So. Um, we're doing it late. I'm gonna go pick up some local transplants probably tomorrow and then fill in any gaps You know, maybe I'll try to do the plant transplants with the broccoli and see if, if I do a transplant this late Maybe I could get something um, But anyways, hope those tips help you. Okay, so for planting if you guys have seen in many of my videos I usually use a direct seeder, but if I'm doing it in a raised bed, I'll just use a stick or my hand make a little furrow in the ground and then slowly sprinkle out the seeds by hand. We're planting so many different types of plants. I can't give you recommendations on the spacing for every single thing, but here's what I do. I don't remember every spacing for every single plant. Just throw it in on Google. What's the plant spacing for bunching onions or this or that? And it will give you the rough, the general recommendation. Now, typically, like if you look in gardening books, you can, um, plant things way more intensively than most gardening books will recommend, honestly, after going through six years of market gardening. Okay guys, so now it's time to plant these. I'm not gonna do a super in-depth uh, planting guide. I've already done a couple videos like that that I'll link for you. But what I wanna talk about is planting strategies, what I'm gonna plant in each bed, thinking about the harvest, um, and some other details. And then we're gonna get into seeding in-ground beds. We're gonna do onions, Napa cabbage, and we'll talk about planting garlic as well. So obviously in a raised bed, I can't use my cedar. So what I typically will do is just use a stick like this, and you can either mark it out just by dragging the stick. Another way is if you're, especially if the, the ground's a little wet, you can just push in a stick like this. If you have a little bit thicker stick, that's nice and straight, that, that'll work even better. But that just opened up a nice little line that I can drop seeds and then easily cover up. A lot of times I will plant a raised bed, planting all the rows like this, because that way I can get a lot more diversity. Uh, I, you know, If I'm not growing for sale, I don't need a 30 foot row of beets just for a few people. So you can do beet, radish, turnip, carrot, blah, 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 you know, and you keep going down the line and then you could do a repeating pattern of, of like root veg or, or whatever you want to do and then replace those crops. So because we're not going for a maximum diversity going into fall here, I just want a bunch of root crops and a bunch of greens. We're going to go long way. So we'll do a row of beets or a couple row of beets, couple rows of turnips. Turnips and beets take a little bit longer. They take longer than a radish. So I'll do those two. Uh, together that way when they come out they'll come out around the same time and I can um, Well, I won't be able to replant because we'll be in, in the middle of winter by then 
And then just something else, some idea, other idea to throw out there for you. The reason I'm not going roots, roots is just because um, they'll get a little bit different sunlight being at these different angles. Um, so some might develop better than others. So you hear me say this a lot, roots, fruits, and I guess I would include flowers in that as well. They need full sun. Now when I say flower, I'm referring to an edible flower. So I'm talking about like broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, all of those turn into flowers if they're left to their own devices. So if you're growing something to eat and you're not gonna eat the leaves or something else that plant produces, those will take a lot more sunlight energy to grow. So that's an easy way to remember that in your brain. So for my spacing, I'm going about six inches off of a wall and then I'll space my beets out about every eight to 10 inches. And in we're going into winter, we're gonna have less light. So let's give more space. In the summer, we can compact and go more like an eight inch, but for winter, I'd say maybe it's more 10 to 12 inches to, to really get that good root development that we want. Remember, beet greens are delicious. It is in the spinach family. So those greens are awesome. Those were things I sold as bags of side greens or in my salad mixes at the market. You can kind of see the difference. Obviously it depends on your soil structure. This is a lot of really loose and thick and big chunky stuff in here. So that dragging method does not work as well in these beds, right? Don't you think that pressing it down looks a lot cleaner? And you know, I'm just getting uneven depths here. So that's not good. And for all these seeds we'll be planting, we'll be planting them at a half inch depth. So these were, Detroit red beets. They're a deep, deep, dark red beet. Clear classic one that everybody loves. These are Chiogias. These are the candy cane striped beets when you cut into them. These are beautiful. They sell very well at markets. They're very pretty. So the turnips I'm overseeding on purpose so I can get a bunch of turnip greens that um, I'll harvest out at more of a baby size and then I'll let the remaining go for the turnips. Okay, and then the last step is just going to be to water in with that nutrient Korean natural farming mix that I came up with. And then tonight we're gonna get even more moisture. Uh, so that's all I'm gonna have to do at this point. So I've got four rows of radishes in these beds. If it was summer, I'd probably do five in these three foot beds. But we're gonna do Easter egg radish, which is a classic multicolored radish, French breakfast, a little bit different flavor, not spicy, a little bit more juicy. And then we'll do two rows of these Korean radishes that uh, are great for fermenting. And if you're curious in Korean, it's Altari Mu. Altari is the uh, variety name. And then these Korean seeds, these came from, I think the Korean market where we got groceries one time. You'll notice these seeds have a pink color and that's because they are unfortunately coated in a fungicide. You know, we bought these seeds because my wife wanted to have these specific radishes. I think we, we found now a better place to get Korean seeds where they're not gonna be covered in fungicide. But if you ever see seeds and they're pink or some bright, crazy, weird color, it's because they have a fungicide on them. Do not buy them, don't use them. I'm using them because I've got no other choice. I want, I want to grow these, I don't have the, the better seed. The fungicide is on these to protect these so that a fungus doesn't kill the seed when it's sprouting. This is done commercially quite often, but of course, that's gonna damage our soil biology, which we don't want. Soil biology can overcome this and it can even lock these chemicals up and destroy them over time. So now we're moving on to greens and herbs. We're gonna do the herbs in this bed um, with some of this chard that's already here. Now, see how eaten up this is? There's caterpillars all over this, but these plants are gonna make it, I can just tell, um, because they'll just keep putting off growth. This middle guy may not make it, but the rest of them, they'll keep shooting out new growth fast enough that the caterpillars won't be able to keep up. So here, guys, we're doing kale, some more Swiss chard, spinach, lettuce, arugula, tatsoi, um, and some Korean greens as well. Okay, so I'm gonna be growing these out for like a full kale plant, right? So I don't need to plant a million of them out here. I'll probably just put one every foot or so. Whatever comes up and survives, I will just pick and choose of the ones that survive because some of these might come up and they'll get eaten by a bug, so I'll lose it. So I don't wanna just put like four in here. I'm gonna put a kale and a tatsoi and a spinach every 12 inches 
um, and I'll just make a bunch of rows, and then we'll see what comes up, what survives, what makes it to the what makes it to the adult stage, and then if I need to thin anything out at that point, I just eat it as a baby green. So what I'll do is just take one or two seeds, push my two fingers in about a half an inch, release, move on. Okay, just like that. And then at the end, I'll come back and just brush my hand over to close the hole. Okay, so out of this whole line, I'm gonna get at least two or three kale plants. That's gonna be more than enough for me. So this chard we already kind of have in here. So I'll throw one next to this chard that I think isn't gonna make it. And I'll put maybe just, you know, two, three more spots where chard will go. Spinach, I'll do about six to eight inches apart. Okay, I don't know, I did about 25 holes worth of spinach there. Okay, next to that other spinach, we're gonna do totsoi, which is actually a brassica, so it's a totally different plant family. Okay, now we got some arugula. Now I'm grabbing a, a bigger pinch full of seed, and I'm dropping a little bit each time I put my fingers in a hole, so I'm able to do about four holes now, just with my fingers. So this here is my salad mix. This is back from when I was selling at the farmer's market. There's still a little bit of that seed left, so what we're gonna do is make our own little salad mix here. A ton of seed everywhere, because it's just gonna be a little baby mix I'll come through and harvest with a knife for salad or sandwiches or whatever. Now things like lettuce or greens that you want all the time, you should plant them every two or three weeks. Make sure you see so you can have a constant harvest. But going into winter here, this is, you know, beginning of uh, October here. This is kind of the end of when you can plant anything in zone 7A. So there's another method of planting seeds, just punching it in like that. You know, up to like 50 punches in a bed would be reasonable. Beyond that, it's gonna be maybe too much work and then you would wanna seed it out. But when I'm trying to grow a plant to a single plant, like a bunch of kale or a bunch of chard or a bunch of mustard greens, something like that, it ends up only being one plant and it takes up a pretty large area. So just punching in a bunch of options for yourself so that some will die, some will live, and then once they get bigger, you can select what you want. So I'll do these last two by myself using these same methods and then let's move on to the in-ground beds. So now we're gonna plant these three beds where the beans were. So I've got about four pounds of garlic seed coming. I'm doing elephant and red garlic. Um, and that will take up just one of these 30 foot beds. About a pound of garlic can plant 20 to 25 row feet. So like one row of garlic. So for this 30 foot bed, that'll be around four pounds. So this is already taken. This bed, I'm going to do all onions. Walla Walla onions, we're growing them for bulb size onions, so we'll harvest them about in spring. Now you can plant these in the beginning of September. I'm a little late, so we'll see how we do. And then this final bed will be Napa cabbage, which grows humongous. It's gonna overtake the entire bed. And I'm gonna try and just do a row of bunching onions on each side of that to try to get a little bit of an extra harvest before the Napa cabbage gets super huge. And then as time goes on, this next bed is potatoes and carrots. That's gonna come out in the next week. Um, and then we could do maybe one more bed of onions, uh, or I'll switch over to these last few beds. Once they get pulled out, I'll switch over to cover crop. And I have a garden mix cover crop that I like to use from True Leaf Market where I get all my seeds. It's an excellent diverse mix. Um, so I'd recommend using that if you don't want to make your own. I've made my own before that you can see how I, how I did that. Um, but this one's just ready to go and easy. So and it's got everything from, you know, your root and radishes um, to rye grass to clovers to legumes. Like it's got everything that you would want in that mix. So if you wanna get into some cover cropping on your garden beds, that's the one I would just pick up because it's just so plug and play. Uh, and of course, I'll be using my Earthway Cedar to do all of this. So what I'm gonna do first is just use my rake and get my beds back to normal. They've spread out over that growth period and from ripping out the beans. So we're just gonna re-manage these beds, get them nice again, and then run the, the cedar through just like I talked about. So for my onions, I did six rows. You can do them about every six inches. So on a three foot bed, that's six rows. The middle bed is gonna be garlic. I kind of switched things up. And then the furthest bed here is where I did the Napa cabbage. Now I want you to imagine I did that in September. And then on the sides, I did two rows of bunching onions down the sides. That way, even if the Napa doesn't work out, we're still gonna get something along the sides there. Oh, and if I was gonna do that cover crop mix I was talking about with that cedar, I would use the beet seed plate for that. 
Um, for the onion seed, obviously I use the onion, the smallest plate. And then for the cabbage, um, I just punch that in. Those need to be like three, four feet apart because they're such huge, huge plants. So we're coming to the end here of our garden season. Still got a couple watermelons. We got sesame. There's still tomatoes coming on over there. Um, all the winter squash basically are harvested now. So almost done, almost going into winter here. So we're just doing the last final planting and yeah, hope you guys got your fall crops in already. And if you haven't, I hope you're in an area where it's still not too late, or maybe you can find some transplants to pop in there that will get some growth really quickly for you. Um, if not, I hope this helps you next year planning your fall garden. Please be sure to check out all my links down in the description to the videos I mentioned and the products that I mentioned. I put those down there to make it really easy for you.